The Enigma of the Scarlet Beast of Revelation 17 In this video, we will decode the Enigma of the Scarlet Beast of Revelation 17. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the notification button so that you don't miss any of my future videos. If you find this video helpful, please like and share. This Bible prophecy explains things that will occur just before all things come to an end. If you want to know what's going to happen to those of us who are living in the time of the end, stay tuned. My pledge to you, we will be using the Bible to explain itself. No guesswork required. In video number one of Revelation 17, we learn that a woman in Bible prophecy symbolizes God's people as a group. In the Old Testament, the woman represented the people of Israel. In the New Testament, the Bride of Christ is the Christian Church. We also learn that the woman clothed with the sun in Revelation 12.1 symbolizes God's ideal true church. Finally, the great harlot of Revelation 17 symbolizes a Christian church which has apostatized, persecuted, and committed fornication. For more details, see the video link in the notes below on Revelation 17, The Harlot. What does the Bible tell us about the scarlet beast of Revelation 17? Revelation 17, 3 reads, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Point number one. The prophet John was carried by the Spirit forward into a future time that is represented in chapter 17 as the wilderness. In Revelation 21 verses 9 and 10, an angel invited John to watch the holy city come down from heaven. This invitation carried John's mind forward to the end of the millennium. Revelation 21.9 reads, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. In the same way, at the beginning of Revelation 17, an angel gave John an invitation to come and see the judgment of the great harlot. This invitation carried John's mind forward to the era of the judgment, which coincides with the beginning of the time of the end. Therefore, Revelation 17 must be interpreted from the time points of 1798 and 1844, because these two time prophecies mark the beginning of the time of the end. Point number two. When is the beginning of the time of the end? There are two end-of-time prophecies that are pertinent to this question. The first one is found in Daniel 12, 7-10, which reads, Then I heard the man clothed in linen, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. In chapter 12, the angel tells Daniel that the time prophecy would last 1260 years. In verse 9, we read that the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. The 1260-year period ended in 1798 when French General Berthier, under Napoleon, deposed Pope Pius VI, who was taken prisoner and transported to France. The Pope died one year later in Valence, France. From that time to this, the papacy has lost the arm of civil power to enforce its papal decrees. General Berthier's actions were a direct fulfillment of the prophecy of the deadly wound. The healing of the deadly wound has not yet occurred. We look for this fulfillment in the very near future. If the infliction of the deadly wound resulted in the Pope losing his power to enforce a papal decree, then the healing of the deadly wound will result in the papacy regaining the power of enforcement. This line of prophetic time ended in 1798, and the angel declared this to be the time of the end. The longest time prophecy in the Bible ended in 1844. Daniel 8.13 reads, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, 
How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. This prophecy spanned 2,300 years, beginning in the time of the Medo-Persian Empire and ending in 1844. The angel declares that this vision refers to the time of the end. With the fulfillment of these two prophecies, humankind has reached the end of prophetic time. There is no other prophetic timeline that yet needs to be fulfilled. You and I are living in the time of the end. Point number three. What does a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, symbolize? We have encountered this seven-headed, ten-horned beast before. See the video links in the notes below for more detailed information. But to summarize, in Daniel chapter 7, we read of four beasts that among them have seven heads and ten horns. Then, in Revelation 12.3, we read of a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Finally, in Revelation 13, we read of a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. These three apocalyptic prophecies are parallel prophecies that build on each other, and each provides the reader with additional information. What are these beasts? Luckily, we don't have to guess. The Bible gives us the answer. Daniel 7.17 reads, Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. And Daniel 7.23 reads, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. We learn from these two verses that in Bible prophecy, beasts represent kings and kingdoms. What do the horns on the beast represent? Daniel 7.24 reads, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. We know from history that Rome deteriorated into ten kingdoms. These kingdoms make up modern Europe. The beasts in all four prophecies are one and the same. These prophecies focus on kingdoms that have persecuted God's people throughout the prophetic time period. Daniel was shown the names of the first three kingdoms that were represented by these beasts. The prophecy of Daniel chapter 2 is the key to understanding the beasts of Daniel 7 and Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Daniel 2.37 tells us that the first kingdom is Babylon. In Daniel 5.28, we learn that Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. Daniel 10.20 tells us that the third kingdom is Greece, which was divided into four sections, explaining why the leopard-like beast had four heads. And the fourth dreadful beast is explained in Daniel 11.20, where we read of an imposer of taxes. This was Caesar Augustus, the first Caesar to rule the imperial Roman Empire. In Daniel 7, we learn about divided Rome and papal Rome. Revelation 13 is an in-depth study of papal Rome and of the role of America in prophecy. And finally, in Revelation 17, we are studying the same seven-headed, ten-horned beast. But in this prophecy, the beast arises out of the bottomless pit, not out of the water. In Revelation 13, we read that one of the beast's heads had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. Now, in chapter 17, the beast is pictured coming up out of a bottomless pit. Revelation 17, 8 reads, The beast that you saw was, and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. According to Strong's Concordance, the word bottomless pit was translated from the Greek word abusos, which means bottomless, the abyss, the pit, a common receptacle of the dead. In other words, this beast is shown as coming back from the dead. He's been resurrected after having sustained a mortal wound. The harlot woman of Revelation 17 is sitting on the back of a scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns. The woman, who represents an apostatized Christian church, is sitting on a beast that represents the civil governments which reign during the prophetic time periods we are studying. 
Those governments are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Divided Rome, Papal Rome, the United States of America, and finally Papal Rome, after its resurrection from the deadly wound it received in 1798 by General Berthier during the French Revolution. Point number four. Who are the ten horns of Revelation 17? Revelation 17.12 reads, The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. This verse confirms that the ten horns symbolize ten kings. But whereas in the first section of Revelation 13, the ten horns represented the ten kings of Europe who carried out the papal inquisitions, crusades, and other forms of persecution against God's true church during the Dark Ages, the ten horns of Revelation 17 reign at the time of the end and will be global in nature. How do we know this? Revelation 13.12 tells us that the second beast, the United States of America, exercises all the authority of the first beast, the papacy, and causes those who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The time period which begins in Revelation 13.11 and is addressed in Revelation 17 is the time of the end. There will be some type of global religion and global government established during this time. The Bible is silent as to the details. It doesn't tell us specifically what this global government will look like or who will be in power. But the ten kings symbolize some type of world government or new world order. I won't venture any guesses. Since Revelation 13 tells us that the United States will be leading the movement toward a one world religion, it could be that she will also be a primary player in setting up a new world government. All this sounds like some outlandish conspiracy theory. This movement is so foreign to the tenets of the Constitution of the United States that it seems impossible to us now. But the parallel prophecies of Revelation 12, 13, and 17 are telling us what the very near future has in store for us. Point number five. How long will the ten horns receive authority as kings with the beast? Revelation 17.12 reads, But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. This verse is telling us that the union of the ten kings and of the beast will only endure for a brief period of time. If this verse is interpreted using prophetic time, then one hour represents a literal period of about two weeks. Let's take a moment to look at the calculation. One prophetic day is made up of 24 prophetic hours and equals one literal year made up of 360 days. 360 literal days divided by 24 prophetic hours equals 15 literal days. This is known as a day-year principle of prophetic time and is used in Ezekiel 4.6 which reads, You shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. Ezekiel was instructed by God that one day was representative of one literal year. The day-year principle is also taught in Numbers 14.34 which reads, According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, Forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years. Moses here explains to the children of Israel that they will live in the desert for forty years. Each year is represented by one day. Jesus uses this same day year principle to prophesy that he would minister for three years and then he would be crucified. Luke 13.32 reads, And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, 
I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. According to Strong's Concordance, the word hour was translated from the Greek word hora, which can mean a day, hour, instant, or season, depending on the context in which it is used. Therefore, this brief time period could be as short as two weeks or could last for a season, such as spring, summer, fall, or winter. Regardless if it's two weeks or a season, it represents a very brief period of time in which the global world government will reign with the beast. Point number six. What service will the kings provide to the beast? Revelation 17.3 reads, These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. In the same way that Revelation 13 prophesies that the United States will use her civil power to pass Sunday laws and to establish a worldwide religion in which all people will worship the Pope, these ten kings will use their civil power to establish a world government. They will give the civil power and authority of this world government to the beast for a brief period of time. Point number seven. What does making war with the lamb signify? Revelation 17, 14 reads, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Revelation chapters 12, 13, and now 17 all prophesy that at the time of the end, the papal system will once again persecute God's true church. Revelation 17, 6 reads, I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, during her rule of 1260. 60 years, the papacy martyred millions of true believers. She used the armies of the kings of Europe to persecute the saints through her inquisitions, crusades, and wars. Daniel 11.33 reads, Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. And Daniel 7.25 instructs us that the church would persecute the saints of the Most High. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs and other books that detail her bloody reign. This verse also tells us how the war ends. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, will overcome them. Yes, people will suffer persecution, and many will be martyred, but in the end Jesus will return to this earth and will save his people. Point number eight. If the seven heads represent the seven great ancient kingdoms, and the ten horns represent a future world government, what did the angel's explanation to John regarding the beast that was, and is not, and yet is actually mean. Revelation 17.7 reads, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was, and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come, and when he comes he must continue a short time. The beast that was, and is not, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. Although this explanation sounds complicated, it's very simple, and you already know the answer to the riddle. In verse 7, the angel tells us the beast has seven heads and ten horns. We have already established that the seven heads symbolize the seven ancient kingdoms that were introduced to us in the prophecies of Daniel and in Revelation 13. Because papal Rome received a deadly wound in 1798 by General Berthier, A., John was told papal Rome is not. John was carried forward into the beginning of the time of the end to see the judgment of the harlot. Therefore, John was told the beast at that particular point of time is not. This wounded beast is the eighth because it will be given power and authority to reign again after its deadly wound is healed. The angel is telling us that the eighth kingdom is not an entirely new kingdom. 
The Eighth Kingdom is one of the original seven ancient kingdoms that were presented to us in the lines of prophecy addressed in Daniel and Revelation. The angel has taken great care to point our attention to the kingdom that received the deadly wound to let us know it will reign again. Point number nine. What is the significance of the waters upon which the harlot sits? Revelation 17.15 reads, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The Bible is explaining to us that the apostatized church sits on the masses of people and they are under her control. We are also shown in this chapter that she is sitting on the beast. Revelation 17.3 reads, And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. This picture is showing us that her power to persecute has been temporarily suspended. This is a graphic image of separation of church and state. In Revelation 13, the medieval church of the Dark Ages was represented by a beast. There was no separation of church and state. The civil governments were so interrelated with the papacy that the symbol for this time period was that of a single beast which represented both entities. She used the military power and the authority of the civil governments to persecute and martyr millions of true believers during her reign. Point number 10. What is going to happen after the kings give their power and authority to the beast for one hour? Revelation 17:16 reads, And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. This verse foretells that the kings of the earth will ultimately turn against the papacy. It says they will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. These are symbols that portray vicious hostility, but the Bible is silent as to the details of what will literally occur. Point number 11. Revelation 17, 9 reads, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And Revelation 17, 18 reads, And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. What do mountains represent in Bible prophecy? In Jeremiah 51, verses 24 and 25, Babylon is called a destroying mountain. And in Daniel 2, verses 35, 44, and 45, we see that God's kingdom is represented by a mountain that filled the whole earth. In Bible prophecy, a mountain is a symbol of a kingdom or nation. The angel uses three different symbols to represent the ancient empires. Those three symbols are heads, mountains, and kings. They all represent the same thing. However, in these two verses, we read that she is a great city and she sits on seven mountains. This appears to be a hint to help the reader further identify who the prophecy is about. Just as in Revelation 13, we are given a clue that the number of his name was 666. So in this chapter, we are told this great city sits on seven mountains. Which famous city sits on seven mountains? A simple Google search will bring up the city of Rome, also known as the city of seven mountains. In my next video, we will study the woman, the child, and the dragon of Revelation 12. Like and share this video if you found it helpful. Until next time, God bless you.